And we do, we stand on his promises because his promises never fail. We can stand on, they're a solid rock, they're a solid foundation. The only time they seem to fail is when we get them wrong. And sometimes we do that. Sometimes we think we know what the Bible says, <clears throat> and it doesn't always say that. And so we've been looking at some of the things that the Bible actually does not say, and instead what it really says about them. We've talked about several things. I'm going to share one with you today. <clears throat> Excuse me, but you've probably heard the story about the woman. She had identical twins, two boys, but she gave them up for adoption. One of them went to an Egyptian couple. They named him Amal. The other went to a Spanish couple. They named him Juan. They grew up. The boys got married, went on with their lives. But later in life, Amal, or Juan, connected with his mother and sent him a picture. And she was looking at the picture and she was lamenting. She said, I, I love this, this boy even though I haven't known him. I wish I could just see his brother. And her husband looked at her and said, dear, they're identical twins. If you've seen one, you've seen them all. <laughs> yeah, let me just kind of soak in. I know it's a bad joke. It's a bad joke, but, it, but it, kind of, it kind of plays in with what we're talking about today. Because sometimes we think if we've seen one, we've seen them all. And I've heard people say something very similar to that about sin. That if you've seen one sin, you've seen them all. That they're all alike. That one sin is just the same as the other. And so... Okay, Brent, you're going to have to help me. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> in all fairness, Brent tested this thing out over and over this morning, and it worked every time, right? Something in my hand, there's an electromagnetic curse or something that, that doesn't like me. So, whew, he's, Brent's going to help us. <clears throat> but have you ever heard this said? Every sin is the same? Raise your hand if you've heard that. Yeah, okay, you've heard it too. <clears throat> every sin is the same. But that's not what the Bible says. You won't find that in the Bible. And you go, Doug, wait, wait, wait. Yes, I do. It's in James chapter 2. Here's what James chapter 2 says. It says, for, every keeps, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you should not commit adultery also said you should not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. I think that's interesting. <clears throat> James says, if you're a murderer, you are a lawbreaker. Well, we go, duh. We know that. But the idea is <clears throat> you're guilty of the whole law. If you break one of them, you've broken, in essence, all of them. So maybe you're not a murderer. Maybe you're... Gossip? Maybe you'd like to talk about people behind their back. Maybe you're a... No, nobody in here would be a grumbler. But grumbling, did you know that's a sin? And so if you're a grumbler, if you grumble about things, that's like committing murder, right? If every sin is the same. If you were one who finds fault instead of encouraging, then you may as well be a genocidal maniac who murders millions because every sin is the same, correct? Right? No? If, <clears throat> if I steal a pack of gum, <clears throat> that's the same as raping children? It doesn't make sense, does it? It just doesn't sound right. It can't be all the same. And yet, many times we hear this, every sin is the same. And it does some things to our witness that is a problem. God never says every sin is the same. And we need to be careful that we speak the way that God speaks. There's a problem with saying that all sin is the same. 
For one, it causes people to doubt the veracity, the truthfulness, the trustworthiness of the gospel. If we say something like, every sin is the same, so stealing a pack of gum would equal raping children, people say, no, it doesn't equal. It is not the same. And if you're telling me that and you're believing that, how can I believe anything else you say? And it causes people to doubt our witness. It causes people to doubt Christianity and its claims. And yet it's a popular phrase. <clears throat> Listen to a fellow on the radio. Christians will call him all the time. He's Jewish. The Christians call him and they say, every sin is the same. I hear it over and over on the radio. Broadcasting to thousands, millions of people. And I would hang my head and go, no, don't say that. That's not true. The Bible doesn't say that. Although it sounds like it because it says if you sin in one, then you're guilty of the whole thing. But what is that really saying? God even shows that he thinks that sins are different than one another. There are different consequences that God lays down for sin. In the Old Testament, in the law, it's spelled out through Exodus, and through Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, it's spelled out. And he has different consequences for different sins. Why? Because they are different. They range all the way from offering a sacrifice, and it might be a dove. It might be a cake, a flower cake. It might be a ram, it might be a bull, it might be an ox. But it's a sacrifice that they offer to care for their sin. But there are other sins where they are completely cut off from the community and exiled. And there are other sins where they're stoned, killed, burned to death because of that sin. God says there are sins that are different. Some can be handled this way, and some need to be handled this way. Because they are different. They are not all the same. So we need to be careful how we say that. There are things that the Lord hates. The Bible talks about the things which are abominations to the Lord. Things that are detestable in His eyes and in his ears and his nose, his mouth. He, he hates certain things. And the Bible is very clear, very adamant about that. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 26 about Judas. He talks about Judas. He's sitting at the Last Supper, and he says, one of you guys going to betray me. And they go, me? Not me. Surely not I. And he says this, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but, but, woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Those are big words coming from Jesus, aren't they? If you practice this, if you do this, you would have been better off had you never been born. Because it's going to get bad. This is a sin that you're not going to recover from. And Judas didn't. We see Paul saying, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he says, Flee, run away, escape from sexual immorality. And he says this then, All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. There's a difference in sin. There's a difference in the consequence, a difference in, the, in how God looks at it. He says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. He says, there are differences here. You might tell a little fib over here. You might do that. But you start sinning against your own body and it's going to be different. 
you're going to have a different consequence. You're going to have different results. Proverbs chapter 6, he talks about the things that the Lord hates. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. And he lists these seven. Haughty eyes, prideful eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. He says, God hates these things. They are detestable in his sight. Now, God hates all sin, doesn't he? And yet, the writer of the Proverbs points these out. These aren't just sins. These are things that God really hates. There's a different consequence to these because there's a different weight given to them. And so we find out that not all sin is the same. God recognizes the difference in sin. And when we tell people every sin is the same, they look at us like we're crazy. And maybe we are. Because we've neglected what God said about sin. And yet... What we hang on to and what we base this phrase off of is very true. There is a common consequence to sin. Whether it be a little white lie or whether it be mass murder, the consequence is that it separates us from God. And here's where the sin, that's where the phrase comes from. No matter what the sin It separates me from God. It destroys the relationship I have with him. If it goes unrepentant, there is no union between me and God anymore. And here's what Paul says about it. He says, everyone has sinned. Everyone has fallen short of God's glory. Nobody has matched his level of perfection. We are all sinners. We all, read Romans chapter 3. It's very depressing. (laughs) But it talks about us. Every single one of us. And so, we might not be mass murderers. I don't think. Anybody here a mass murderer? Good. We're probably not mass murderers. But has anybody here grumbled? Oh, man. I'm sorry. You guys are out of luck. Because all of our sin does separate us. Except by God's grace and except by his provision, except by the fact that he paid the price and we have to accept that price, we are separated from God because of that sin. God looks at sin differently. There are different consequences to sin. But there's a danger in that for us. When we realize that, we recognize that because we like to compare ourselves with each other. And that's a dangerous thing to do because it's, you can find, always find somebody better than you and you can always find somebody worse than you, can't you? And when we do that, we fail to meet up to the perfection that God calls of us. And we start comparing ourselves and then we can say, well, my sin's not as bad as their sin. And I've told you before, some of the hardest people I ever had to work with as youth minister were kids who'd grown up in the church. Because they were good kids they didn't do all the things that the people at school did they go back to their parents and say mom dad you don't know how good you've got it (laughs) because I'm a good kid and they are they were but they rested in that they took comfort in the fact that they weren't as bad as somebody else and they forgot the fact that maybe they weren't as bad as a mass murderer but they were just as lost as a mass murderer. Because by our very nature, Paul says, we are by nature children of wrath. We are by nature children to be destroyed. We are by nature children who turn away from God, who follow our own ways. It started in the garden of Eden. It 
just outside the garden. No in the Garden of Eden. Started in the Garden of Eden, in the most perfect situation, we couldn't be faithful to God. There's just something in us that makes us turn away. So I want you to know, sin is not a play word. It's not a made-up word. It's not a, an old-fashioned word. It is a word that means I've missed the mark, and the mark is perfection. Jesus said, be perfect as my Father, as your Father is perfect. And that's too big for us. We can't do that except by the power of the Spirit and by the gift of God through Jesus' blood. Amen? It is good news because without it, we are lost. But I want to share with you a little bit this morning that our lives as Christians are not so much about not sinning. God warns us against sinning. He warns us about pursuing our own selfish nature, our own wants and overlooking other people. But there were people who followed the law that he gave them. They devoted themselves to follow the law. And God still says, I reject you. Because you don't have a relationship with me, you're only doing things to be right. And he wants more than just being right. He wants a relationship with us. He wants a love relationship with us. That's why he gave us free will. That's why he tells us to choose. He wants us to choose him. We can choose to follow all the check marks and still have unrepentant hearts. We can choose to follow all the check marks and try to do everything right and to avoid the sin and never love God at all. And the greatest commandment is what? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. Love him. God wants us to draw near to him and to hold on to him. And so Ephesians 5, Paul writes something to us. He says, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. I love that picture. Understand that he loves us. And so we follow him, returning that love to him. He says, and walk in the way of what? Walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. He says, this is what I want for you. This is what I want from you. I want a relationship where we walk in love that you know you are a dearly loved child. And you walk loving your father. And you walk in the way of love, loving the father's children. And you walk in a way so that people know that you're my disciples by the way you love each other. That there are relationships that are built. Because people are important to God. He loves people. And he calls us, the second greatest commandment, to love our neighbor as ourself. To love the people that he loves. But he didn't stop there. Paul kept on going. Verse 3, he said, but among you who are walking in the way of love, he says this, there must not even be a What's that word? A hint. Okay, I'm, I've told Julie before, don't, don't give me hints. I'm, I'm slow at picking up on hints. You want me to know something? Tell me flat out. Just give it to me or else I'm, I'll miss it. Because hints are small. Hints are easy for us to miss. And he says here, there shouldn't even be a small speck of these things in your lives as Christians. And look at this list. He said there's not even a hint of sexual immorality. <clears throat> okay, I, okay. I think hint. What does that mean? Does that, is that just, you know, sexual intercourse with somebody that you're not married to? No, that's not a hint. That's the boom in your face. What would a hint of sexual immorality be? 
pornography. The movies we see, the TV shows we watch, the jokes we tell. But he says, here's the relationship I want with you. I want you to love me so much that you wouldn't want to hurt me. You would not want to, to sully my name by pursuing things that are not of me. There should not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. God's people who are fashioned after him, made in his image, saved by his grace, made pure and holy because of the death of Jesus on the cross. They are improper for those kind of people. He said, nor should there be obscenity. Yeah, well, that's just the way I talk. You know, it's, I grew up that way. And he said, the Spirit can change that. Listen to the Spirit. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather our lives and our speech should be full of what? Does that reflect your life as Christians? And he's talking to Christians here. Does that look like your life? I hope so, but you know, sometimes it doesn't. And God knows that. That's why he sent Jesus. If we were perfect in this, we wouldn't need Jesus. However, just because he sent Jesus doesn't give us room to say, oh, well, I'm forgiven. God understands. No, he says, this is what God says. There shouldn't be a hint of that in your life. We should stand apart from the world. It's not just about not sinning because all sin is the same. He says, no, sin is serious. And here's how serious it is. There shouldn't even be a hint of this among you as God's people. And I believe that the church in America is largely in decline because people have said, it doesn't really matter. I'm saved anyway. I can do whatever I want to. And we act one way at church and we act another way on Monday morning. And our lives are not consistent. And God is not glorified in that. He goes on. Verse 5, he says, For of this you can be sure that no immoral impure or greedy person, such a person as greedy is an idolater, he says, none of those people have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Oh my goodness. He's just told us that 99% of us are, have no hope. No, he just told us that 100% of us have no hope. None. And when I understand that, when I realize that, then I can truly give thanks to God for his grace. When I realize that I have no hope in the world and I am a sinner, separated from God, I have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God by my will, by my goodness, by my knuckling down, gritting my teeth and trying to do everything right, I fail. Every one of us, right? He goes on. Let no one deceive you with empty words because of such things. God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, don't even be partners with them. Watch out for the people that you partner with, that you associate with, that you put yourselves with. He says you don't even partner with those people. You don't hang with those people. They are not your buddies. They are not your people that you marry. They are not people you even go into business with. You don't partner with somebody who has a whole different value system than you do. Paul should have put in parentheses here, he said, instead, you should pray for the Spirit of God to embolden you, that for the Spirit of God to bear His fruit in you. And we heard, Jeff, read about that fruit this morning, love, patience, kindness, goodness. These things that are of God, that's the fruit he wants to bear in us. 
And then he said this, verse 8. <clears throat> he says, one time you were darkness. One time you used to live amongst the world. You didn't know Christ. You didn't know his goodness. You didn't know his love. You didn't know his power. You didn't know his faithfulness. And you lived in the darkness just like everybody else. And you had no hope in the world. He says, but now you've given your life to Christ. Now you put his name on. Now you put the mantle, you've been clothed with Christ. So, he says, live as children of light. Now, you see in this sentence, there's this parenthetical statement right in the middle of the sentence. You can move that grammatically. You can move that to a different place in the sentence. Because sometimes, when he puts that parenthetical statement right in the middle of the sentence, it, it breaks the sentence up and we forget the last part of it. Let's just skip over that parenthesis for a minute. We'll come back to it. But he says, live as children of light and find out what pleases the Lord. Here's what children of light do. They spend their time not trying not to sin. They spend their time trying to find out what honors their father, what pleases their God. Because now there's a relationship when I understand who God is and how he's loved me and how he's paid a price for me. There's something powerful there, and I want to return to him. This act of worship that we did this morning of taking this body and remembering Jesus and what he was like and taking that cup and remembering the promise he made to us and the cost of that promise to be our salvation. And then we get to return to him an expression of our gratitude. What a beautiful situation. And here's what he says. Find out how to do that, how to honor him, how to please him. And we ask ourselves, is he pleased with me? I would be devastated. Now, not all of you had the same experience as I did. I grew up in a family. We had our troubles. But oh my goodness. Overall, my fa I lived a charmed life. My parents loved me. My brothers and sisters, we loved each other. We connect. We still do. We it, it is a, it's a beautiful relationship. They taught us about Christ. They raised us in a Christian home. It was a powerful situation. They loved each other. They gave us a model of what it meant. It was a beautiful situation. But I tell you what. I, if I ever thought that I was disappointing my father, I, I, I couldn't bear that. My father was not a real, lovey, expressive sort of a man. But I remember, bold, clearly, the day that he told me and my other brother, as he was getting ready for surgery, very scary surgery, and he just looked at us with tears in his eyes. He says, I am so proud of both of you. Someday, I want to hear my father in heaven say, well done, good and faithful servant. I don't want to hear him say, well, you, you, know, you, did, da, 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 you did this and you didn't do that. I don't want him to go to that checklist. I want him to wrap me in his arms. And I want him to say, I love you and you have done well. And I am proud to call you my child. Because there's a relationship between us. I didn't just walk through life going, oh, did I sin? Did I sin? I can't sin. I can't, I can't be. I can't. I, I, it's more than not sinning. It's building a relationship that God wants from us. And that's why we want to walk in. And how do you do that? It takes time. It takes dedication. It takes calling him on the phone that we call prayer. It talks. It's not like just a, a text. It's, it's involving ourselves 
in him and spending time listening to him and speaking to him. We need to be people who draw near to God. But oftentimes we want to please ourselves. Friend, I think I had this up there, 1 Corinthians 8. In 1 Corinthians 8, Paul is talking about Christians who have rights. And he says, you guys have the right to do this. You can do this. It's not wrong. You can do it, and it's okay. You can eat meat offered as idols, and it's okay because it means nothing in the end. You can drink, and you can party, and you can do all kinds of things, and it's okay except for the people that it influences. And if you are consumed with what's right for you, and not what's right for everybody else. You have fallen into sin. And you have forgotten the relationship that's powerful. He says this in verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 8. He says, when you sin against these people in this way, and you wound their weak conscience, here's what you do. You sin against Christ. You sin against Jesus when you sin against somebody else. When you cause somebody to do something that didn't, for you is okay, but it's not good for them. That's a heavy burden to bear. That makes us responsible for each other, doesn't it? Everybody want to be responsible for everybody else? No, I don't want that. And yet, here's what he says. You, as my people, are responsible for the people around you. They watch you and they follow you. And you influence them and you help them make decisions and what's right for you may not be right for them. And if you cause them to do something that's not of faith, it is sin for them and you have sinned against Christ. And so Paul says there, he says, therefore if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin. I will never eat meat again. If I influence somebody else to sin, I will just never do that. I'll give it up. Not that I have to. It's my right. But I'm responsible for other people. Because these other people are people that God loves. And I have a relationship with God. And it's not just about not sinning. It's about helping people to build this relationship with God and to walk in the joy of His presence and to find our comfort and our meaning there. And then I've heard people say, you know, Doug, that's, man, there's a lot of stuff. This is hard. This thing's like a burden to bear. You know what? All I want to do is get into heaven. I don't have to be the big shot. I don't have to have the biggest mansion in heaven. I just, I just, just put me in the basement, you know? As long as I'm there, it's okay, right? You ever said that? Yeah? As long as I just squeak in there, I'm okay. Let's talk about that for just a moment. First Corinthians 3, Paul talks about something very similar to that. He says, verse 10 of First Corinthians 3, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than what is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. And Paul is saying, listen, I taught you about Jesus. I laid a foundation for your life. He is the source. He is the strength. He is the reason. He is the sacrifice. He is the ultimate end. He is the relationship we need to build with. That's the foundation. Jesus lived, he died, he was buried, he rose, he's coming back again, and he paid the price for our sin. That's the foundation. Now, there are builders who are building on that foundation, and you can build on that foundation all kinds of different things. Here's what he says. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is. Because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test the quality of each person's work. 
What does fire do to wood? What does fire do to hay? What does fire do to gold? He refines it, silver, costly stones. Here's what he says. Verse 14. If what has been built on this foundation survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss and yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Okay. Paul's saying there's a foundation that is unshakable. When you put yourself in Christ, he is powerful to forgive us and cleanse us from all sin, make us pure and righteous. That's good news. But he says, just as not all sin the same, not all works are the same either. You can build on this foundation, and you can build, and you can receive reward, or you can lollygag. That's a good word. I like that. Lollygag. Or you can not take it seriously, and everything you do will be burned up. We have watched people whose homes have been burnt, and they have lost everything. They've lost family members. They've lost all their earthly possessions. They've lost their hope for the future. They've lost all kinds of things. They come out with barely a shirt on their back. We've seen this repeated over and over just in the past few weeks. He says, that's how you'll get to heaven. Escaping through the flames, not having anything, everything that's precious to you stripped away. And you say, yeah, but I made it in the basement. I'm cool. That's not the picture that Paul gives. He says, you will be saved, but it will be as one escaping through the flames. Your clothes on fire, everything that's precious to you is gone. Or you can build a relationship with Jesus. Not worry so much about crossing the T's and dotting the I's, but about building a relationship of love and trust and following him and honoring him and finding out what's pleasing to my father and building with something that's precious, gold and silver, doing the things that he calls us to do, loving our neighbors, feeding the, the sick, <laughs> visiting the sick, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, taking care of the widows and the orphans, doing the things that honor God. And he says, there will be a reward. You will understand heaven in a whole different way than somebody who doesn't do those things. You will understand the glory of that relationship so much more than other things, than people who didn't do that. The problem with the saying that all sin is the same is that it causes Christians sometimes to give up. Say, I can't be good enough. I can't do it all, so I give up. And if every sin's the same, if I'm just the same as a homicidal maniac, because I told a white lie, then what hope is there for me? And they give up. But i got to tell you one story before we go. This is a story of Manasseh. Now, Manasseh was one of the children of Jacob. I'm not talking about that one. I'm talking about the king of Israel, the king of Judah, named Manasseh. He was Hezekiah's son. He became king when he was only 12 years old. And in 1 Kings 21, we see his story. He says Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. No term limits back in those days. His mother's name was Hephzibah. That's a great name. But he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. Understand this. This guy, Manasseh, was bad News. He had a great father, but he didn't follow his father's ways. He forgot all about God. Verse 9, he says, But the people, when they were told to turn, they didn't listen to him. Manasseh led them astray, so that they did more evil than the nations the Lord had destroyed before them. Moreover, Manasseh also shed so much innocent blood that he filled Jerusalem end to end. Besides the sin 
that he had caused Judah to commit so that they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. The Bible says that Manasseh was horrible. He did more evil than anybody else. And he led the nation to do more evil than anybody else. He was one of the worst of the kings. But let's pick up his story in 2 Chronicles. It says, So the Lord brought against them, since they were so bad, brought against them the army commanders of the king of Assyria who took Manasseh prisoner, put a hook in his nose, bound him with bronze shackles, and took him to Babylon. Yay. That's, I'm, I'm, I'm with him. I'm clicking on that story. I'm liking that story. Then he gets to verse 12. In his distress, in Manasseh's distress, he sought the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his ancestors. And I want to say, good luck with that. You who led the people into sin, you who are so wicked and so evil. But verse 13 happens. And when he prayed to him, the Lord was moved by his entreaty. And he listened to his plea. So he brought him back to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. And then Manasseh knew that the Lord is God. Okay, is that fair? Manasseh was the worst of the worst. And God said, okay, you, you know, you, you cried a few tears, and now I, it's okay. I love you. Come back. I'll restore you to your kingdom. What was important to God? That heart, that relationship. Even somebody as wicked as Manasseh. If Manasseh can be saved, if Manasseh's heart can be changed, so can mine, so can yours, so can anybody. If the Lord will take Manasseh back, he will take anybody back. The thing is, the Lord will take you right where you're at, wherever you're at, but he is not content for you to stay there where you're at. He calls us back. He gives us a gift. He says it's free for the taking. You have to accept it. All sin is not the same. But all sin does separate us from God. And without his forgiveness, we are all separated from God. None of us have any hope. But it doesn't matter where we've come from. He'll accept any one of us. But he doesn't want us to stay there. He says... I'll put my spirit in you, and you will listen to my spirit, and you will follow my spirit. And there must not even be a hint. As you grow in the spirit, you should look different than the world. And if the world accepts you and you fit right in, there's a problem with that because you're not supposed to be of the world. And so he says, not all sin is the same, but everybody's lost without the grace of God. We're going to sing a song that says, Lord, reign in me. Rule in me. Be the master of my life. I surrender it to you. I'm calling on you to rule in my life. And anybody can sing that song. Anybody can sing those words. But to really mean it, it takes a heart that wants to build a relationship with God. Is that where you're at today? I hope so. Because he's got great promises for those who build a relationship with him. Sin is real. And it separates us from God. But no sin is too great for him to forgive. The way he forgives is by paying the price through his son who died on a cross to show us the promise of eternal life. He said, I will pay your price, the price of your sin. All you have to do is trust in me. Put your faith in me. You respond to me. 
You'll be obedient to me. You walk by the Spirit, not by the flesh. You look through God's eyes instead of your own eyes. You listen to the truth of the word instead of the lies of the world. You put yourself in my hands and walk with me and let me fill your life. The way you start that is by dying to yourself and to your ways. And the way God says to do that is you start in baptism in a grave. You are buried into Christ's death. And you are raised up out of that to walk a brand new life. Filled with his spirit. If you're ready to do that today, we're ready to help you. While we stand and sing this song.